Hi, everyone. Before the interview start, I mean, I never do this usually, but I wanted to tell you about uh, this T-shirt and I, I am wearing. Um, it's made by Pressure Cooker Arts and it's a, a massive fundraising campaign for Gaza. The funds are going to be uh, going towards UNRWA, Macan, and MSF. I'll put the link in the description of the video, but the T-shirt says in Arabic, and in English, you will never walk alone and because um, Gaza will never walk alone. So um, if you want to support the campaign, check the link in the, in the description below. Thank you. Hi, Anin. Hi, Neo. Um, I, I'm, I'm good. Thanks. I guess, you know, as good as I can be or as good as we can be uh, in the midst of what's happening in, in Gaza. Um, huge thanks for, for joining me. Uh, Hanin, you're joining me for, from Japan, Tokyo, and Neo, you're in uh, Toronto. Um, honestly, I'm so happy to talk to you both because, you know, Japan feels like so far away. Uh, that in like the solidarity movement in, in Europe, but also, uh, I guess, in Northern America and stuff, we often don't really know what's happening in Japan. Uh, in a way, Australia is kind of the same as well, even though I think there's, we have more links, but, but Japan is like this kind of unknown. Um, and I've seen in the last few months, loads of posts on Instagram coming from Japan. And I was like, yeah, you know, stuff happening in Japan. And uh, and then I saw you, Neo, at the Venice Film Festival with the Kufiye and the Palestine sort of badge. And I was like, because I was really depressed about the lack of Gaza solidarity in Venice. I mean, it sort of changed in the last few days of the festival. But I think you were one of the first. And I was like, wow, amazing. So having you both um, here today is, is, a, is a pleasure and, and honor um, because we are in the midst I mean, in the midst. It's been like nearly a year now. Uh, and I think for, for anyone with a heart, um, it's been kind of um, a collective trauma for all of us. But I guess um, I'm not going to go through the numbers and stuff because they're horrific. And they actually, they are just numbers. And it's much deeper than, than numbers, you know. But I guess, you know, Hanin, I'll start with you. Um, I was saying we're all living through some kind of collective trauma but obviously the trauma is much higher for, from someone, I guess, from Gaza. Um, you, you were born, I think you were born in, in Gaza. Um, you, uh, you lived there until you were seven years old. And I read an interview where you said that w once you moved to Japan, um, you were surprised in a way that the normal was not drones, bombs, uh, you know, Israeli occupation forces, in incursions. Um, like, do you still have family in, in Gaza? Yeah, so my mom's family is entirely from Gaza, from Khan Yunus specifically. And they've all been living there for all their lives. Um, most of them evacuated uh, around April, but still some of them are still in Gaza. They work for... Um, you know, they work in the medical uh, industry or, you know, for for saving lives, etc. So they decided to stay in Gaza and continue their job of helping their people. So, yeah, there there are still people there and a lot of friends and and friends of family. I mean, Gaza is really so, so, so small. You know, everybody knows everyone and every last name is a familiar last name. So it's it's really that drastic for for everybody. The loss everyone feels and bears the weight of the loss. And I wanted to ask you, like, it's it's a tough one anyway. I, I guess how do you feel about what's happening in Gaza? Being from Gaza, but in a way not being in Gaza now, uh, and I guess that's where also the activism and the solidarity stems from, right? Yeah, yeah, definitely. I mean, 
all my life, you know, I've been very proud of my identity as a Palestinian. And especially when I moved to Japan, where I was so far away from home, but I felt like I really needed to share everything about my home with everybody here so that they can learn about what Palestine is and the beauty of Palestine and our culture and our people. So all my life, I grew up, you know, talking about Palestine, talking about our culture, our food, you know, bringing people into learning about our food and our culture. And, you know, I've had a lot of influence from my family members as well. My grandfather fought many wars for Palestine. Um, my grandmother also worked for the Palestinian Red Crescent and worked with refugees. She was in Sabra and Shatila massacre in Lebanon. Um, my father has also dedicated his whole life to Palestine. So I've had this influence from a very young age. And of course, when this genocide happened, I knew I had to do more and to do everything I can in my power to raise awareness and educate people as much as possible about Palestine. And, and now, um, and I, I, that's also why it's great to have you both, because it's like, uh, you know, a, a Palestinian and a non-Palestinian. Uh, and I think over the last nearly 12 months, it's been horrific. Uh, everything coming out of Gaza has been horrific. But if we try to hold on in a way the, the beauty to, to actually survive, right, and keep going, the, the solidarity around the world from people that are not Palestinians, not from Gaza, uh, has also been... Uh, been sort of tremendous um so wh what do you think like now like is the role of of people like you you know you, you you're japanese but you stand in solidarity with with gaza and um yeah what is your role anyway what is the, the role of artists as well um yeah i um so for me um i definitely was late to the solidarity in that I only began to become more aware and um, become more active after October last year, um, even though, you know, I'm born in America. Um, and so I have had the opportunity to um, come in contact with, you know, um, films and uh, professors and um, people who have been talking about it and yet, you know, I didn't really realize the gravity of the situation until October, really. So I feel kind of ashamed about that. But at the same time, um, I think all of the Palestinians that I've met so far, including Hanin, just kind of welcomes um, everybody as soon as they sort of realize what has been happening for the last, you know, 75 and more years. Um, and so it's been incredible to learn from Hanin, but also everybody else who's been kind of doing this work on the ground. And um, I was in America, in New York um, on October 7th, but um, soon after I actually went back to Japan. And then that's when I c connected with people like Hanin and everybody else. Um, and yeah, it was amazing to see because Japan is not very known for its protest movements right now, um, currently, but all of the people who I met and connected uh, through Solidarity Movement in for Palestine have been extremely young and extremely dedicated um, individuals who also see the kind of structural connections, not just only about Palestine, but with the climate movement or anti-capitalism or anti-US imperialism. Um, and so that has been really incredible to get to know so many people. And it's really been feeling like a family in Japan that you can trust. Um, but I also do want to say that, you know, although it's not very well known um, what's been going on in Japan for Palestine, Japan has a really rich history of solidarity with Palestine since um, the 70s and probably even before that. And I, I'm just not aware. Um, and so I'm only beginning to learn that history and I'm trying to kind of think through um, how we can connect that history, but also update it with what's going on now. I mean, what, what you said, like um, you've been you were like aware of Palestine before, but since October, it's it's changed everything, I guess. Um, and but I think we can we feel this, you know, Hanin, I guess you've been involved in solidarity for your life and October 
from October onwards, I think this genocide, um, I mean, the veil has fallen in a way. It's, it's so clear cut now, you know, um, about what's happening, about Israel's intention in Palestine, that I think it's, again, as horrific as the, the, the massacre and the genocide's been, it brought so many people. I mean, it opened the eyes of so many people around the world about w what's happening in, in Palestine. And I think it's down to us now to kind of grab this moment and, and turn it into a and sort of unstoppable force. Um, and it's not going to be easy uh, because I remember, you know, it's not it's not the first I mean, it's the first genocide in a way, but it's not the first war in Gaza. I remember Operation Cast Lead in 2008, 2009, where activists we were like, I mean, this is going to change everything. There's no way Israel is going to be considered a normal state after that. And then Israel has still received the red carpet all over the world. But this moment is so different. So, and I wanted to go back, I mean, to you, Hanin, but obviously now you can comment. So how do, you know, how does um, Palestine solidarity express itself in, in Japan and in Tokyo? Yeah, I feel like it, it's it's interesting and unique in, in Japan because, you know, it is a, a lot smaller of a community than you see in other places in the States, in Europe. But it's a very mighty community. Community like we're. I always say we're small, but we're mighty. Uh, we're people that are very, very determined and dedicated to achieve results, and that's probably the biggest challenge in any movement. You know, to actually see results and to try and actually achieve something. A lot of times, you feel like you're just kind of screaming in a void. But I feel like when we all put our heads together and, and really think about what we can do and how we can achieve results, we've really been able to do so. And I feel like there's kind of two different examples here. But of course, one of the most well-known ones is how Itochu cut ties with Elbit Systems. That, you know, that news kind of took the world as well. And that was done by us, you know. I know that they cited the ICJ um, and it could be a big reason. I think there's multiple factors that go into play here. It's not just one. But I think a big part of it was us protesting every single day outside of their office. You know, we were doing the petition. We were doing a tweet storm and, and posting a lot on social media to educate people because people had no idea, you know, what each or two even did, really. They just thought it was a big corporation. They had no idea that it would deal with arms um, and defense weapon companies. So that was a huge thing that was accomplished by the community. And I think it's the tightness that's that's the kind of unique characteristic that allows us to move and achieve these results. And yeah, and another idea I feel that went a very long way was we know in Japan, it's it's quite unique in the sense that protest culture is not a huge thing. You know, expressing dissent in public is not a very big or normal thing here so we were trying to think how do we invite people to the movement in the way where we don't scare them away because screaming at people in the street kind of might push them away from the movement rather than bring them in especially if there are a lot of foreigners etc it's a little bit like it's not so obvious why we're screaming so uh, one of our comrades uh, thought of an idea to draw a red teardrop on a massive canvas and just have invite people to come and, and paint a red teardrop as we read the list of uh, the martyrs. And I think that's one of the tough, toughest protests we've done. It's one of the most emotionally tolling protests because we sit there and listen to all these names and truly remember that they are not numbers. These are people with lives and, and we honor them by saying their name. And drawing a red tear and it, it touched a lot of people i think it, it really invited a lot of people to the movement they felt the heaviness they felt the weight the sadness and it also spread all over so you know other cities in japan were doing this also uh, some states so in front of the white house they did it in hawaii in san fran in new york also in germany so it, it really spread because the idea touched so many people and the fact that we're remembering, taking time to remember 
why why we're doing this and who we're doing this for was very important. So these these were kind of some unique things I think that uh, we were able to do because we are also small but mighty. Yeah, and um, I think I can give just a little bit of context for um, listeners maybe who just like don't know anything about what's happening, which is that, um, I, you know, I think Hanin is mainly talking about the community in Tokyo, in the Tokyo area, um, because that's basically where um, the most population is um, who are who've been involved in the solidarity movement. But every city has its own kind of unique community that have been doing very different things um, in each area. Um, so for example, in Hiroshima, um, there is a um, uh, vigil for Palestine that has been happening literally every single day um, for more than 300 days now. Um, and so they're consistently standing there and consistently kind of raising awareness about what's going on. Um, and what's unique about Tokyo, especially though, is that I think um, from the very beginning, everybody tried to center Palestinian voices, um, which in Japan is like not that easy because there's just not that many Palestinians <laughs> um, in Japan. Um, but uh, I think it was extremely important for people, in, especially in Tokyo, to make sure that Palestinian voices are really centered, which is what led to the red teardrop thing, um, because everybody reading the names, generally speaking, were Palestinian. Um and um, and then also what was re really interesting is actually the intersectionality that was born in uh, these movements because there are a lot of LGBTQ uh, folks also in the movement who've um, been extremely active um, people in the environmental movements, you know, all sorts of um, intersections that really came together in solidarity. Um, yeah. Thanks for this, um, both of you. Um, what about the uh, position of the government? It, it seems like from the outside that, I mean, they're not doing much, but they're a bit more nuanced, maybe, than like France, the US, uh, and the rest of, I guess, the Western states. I mean, I'm not saying obviously Japan is a Western state, but uh, w what's the sort of response of the government? Um, yeah, I can maybe take this one, mm -hmm. which is um, Japan is in a very interesting position because until um, I want to say the 50s, uh, maybe a little later, um, Japan was quite reliant on um, oil uh, from the Arab countries. And so it was a little bit more neutral, I would say, regarding Palestine um, compared to other countries such as the US or Germany or any of the other ones in the G7. Um, however, in more recent years, um, Japan has become more and more just kind of following the US's lead. Um, and even more recently in the 2000s, Japan has started to um, sign uh, uh, kind of technological agreements or economic agreements with Israel. Um, and so I think more and more Japan is still kind of like become um, subsumed into what basically the U.S. interests are, unfortunately. Um, but one of the, you know, so one of the big things, um, I mean, I think the biggest concentration for uh, Japan and Japanese activism in solidarity with Palestine has been BDS. And um, so the S part is a big demand that we've been really calling for for the government uh, to sanction Israel and also cut ties with um, the Israeli government um and uh and yeah i think that's kind of the general overview i don't know how Tani has um, any more details yeah i feel like with with japan it's it's interesting again because they do want to maintain that kind of neutrality that that peace that you know they can help both sides type of thing and with palestine i think like deep down they they would want to see a free palestine and a liberated Palestine, but because of the status quo of, of politics, it's they're not able to take that step publicly. So the the way that they feel like they can kind of compensate for that is by giving massive amounts of humanitarian aid to Palestine. 
and supporting them through development projects in Palestine. You know, um, they, there's a whole neighborhood in Khan Yunis called the ja Japanese neighborhood because they helped build it in, in Khan Yunis. So they f I feel like they kind of feel that they need to do something about it. But the only way that they can actually do it now is by, you know, providing aid and humanitarian support. And that's what I would like to kind of see change because Palestine, Palestine is not a charity project and we will never be able to stand on our own two feet if these countries continue to just support economically and, and with aid and not actually help us, you know, liberate Palestine, work on the economy and everything else internally, the business. So I feel like it's kind of a band-aid on the wound, if I may. Same with like NGO MPOs. And it's kind of working against us. But I hope to see them take a more bolder step. I know they've been thinking about recognizing Palestine for a couple of years now. They've been a bit back and forth. Um, I hope I see them do that and also de-recognize Israel simultaneously and, and sanction, etc. And in terms of, I mean, what we've seen in, in Europe and in like North America is an in incredible repression towards activists expressing solidarity with, with Gaza. Um, I was going to say it's mad, but it's not because it's obviously part of what, in a way, um, imperialism and vulture capitalism is. But, um, you know, a lot of activists calling for a ceasefire, so calling for an end uh, of this horror have been prosecuted, criminalized, arrested, uh, viol violently beaten up by the police. Um, in Japan, when you do demonstrations and stuff, what, what's the reaction in a way of the state, of the police? And also, I was wondering, do you have pro-Israel like lobby groups in Japan that are pushing back in a way? Um, yeah, so... I think um, the Japanese government and also police response is exists, but it's not necessarily because anti-Semitism or like a skewed form of anti-Semitism is codified into law, such as in Germany. It's more um, kind of just like against protesting in general. Um, and uh you know, it's a little bit difficult to have escalated actions and protests in Japan because um, the Japanese police, sorry, my, I can't really hear anything. It's uh, am I still connected. Yeah, I mean, we can okay. hear you and see you. Yeah. Okay, okay, great. Um, so um, in Japan, um, protesting that goes beyond just um, kind of standing on the street or police approved uh, marches are a little bit difficult because um, Japan can hold you in detention. Um, the police in Japan can hold you in detention for up to 23 days without charge. And the only um, other countries in these so-called developed nations that can do that are Japan, South Korea, and Israel, um, which tells you a lot, I think. And um, in fact, we had a comrade be arrested for simply protesting in front of the Israeli embassy in Tokyo. Um, and they were uh, held in detention for 21 days, I think, or 22. Um, so it, you know, it jail support and also just being arrested is just kind of um, really difficult. Um, so people have been having to get more creative in how uh, protesting happens. Um, and, uh, about pro-Israel lobbies, I don't know if Hanin, you have more to say yeah. about that. Not that many. Um, no, not that many. I feel like, uh, after October, most of the efforts were coming from the Israeli embassy. You know, they were kind of pushing people to like, try and do things to stand in solidarity with Israel, but that died down very quick. Um, and then most of what they do is very under the table anyways but other groups not really recently a few weeks ago we've had like two three israelis kind of come and stand next to the protest and 
try to like but he came holding the flag and then he saw that all the palestine flags are in the air so he went and got a pole a stick to put his flag and also fly his you know clearly he was new to it so yeah not that many which is which is honestly um uh yeah a blessing i would say as a palestinian that lives here i don't yeah i feel a bit less like stressed about having to deal with something like that especially because if they speak to you and it's like in English, then none of the Japanese people are actually understanding what's going on. They just see people like foreigners yelling at each other. So, yeah, I'm kind of glad that that doesn't happen. We do have Zionists that like to rudely try to interrupt our protests or yell at us. Most of them are tourists, which I think is the funniest part. We pretty much ruin their vacation every time. Um, they go to the main main popular areas and then they just see the Palestinian flag or just waving high in the sky and they're like... It triggers them so much, but we we have a don't talk to disruptors and, and Zionist uh, kind of understanding amongst everybody at the protest. So nobody engages. And if you watch the videos online of Zionists in Japan, it's everyone's just staring at them like the crazy people that they are. So, yeah, that's <laughs> that's the unique part. <laughs> There are a lot of Israeli tourists, uh, especially now. Mm -hmm. um, and I guess the biggest one that happened was that there was an Israeli judo team that came to Japan for like a competition or something. And um, I think it happened to be on the day, land day, yeah. um, when there was like the biggest uh, Palestinian solidarity uh, protest in Shinjuku, which is like the central uh, station. And the judo Israeli judo team like started to take off their clothes and put their judo uniforms on and like started accosting the protesters, but then um, they were shooed away eventually. Um, so yeah, not that many Zionists um, who have come to really accost us like some other cities. Yeah, I, I like this uh, this strategy of like not engaging at all with them because I guess it sort of frustrates them so much and it, so it's quite enjoyable in a way not to give them it's like trolls you know you just let them do their thing hey uh kind of a final question um so neo we saw you in venice with the kufie and 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 the, the badge uh, it brought a lot of joy to people <laughs> yeah because <laughs> i think it's um and i know also because i'm in touch with people in gaza and people sometimes don't realize uh, that people in Gaza see the massive demonstrations, they see people in Venice, they see people in Cannes, and I mean, they feel less alone because that's um, that's part of the of of something that is so depressing that people in Gaza tend to feel completely abandoned and alone, right? So anything we can do to show them that they're not, you know, is quite good. Um, I was wondering if briefly, briefly, you can explain you know, what was the response in a way in Venice. And then maybe the broader question would be for you both. Like, do you have, because we've seen many artists, personalities, cultural figures come out in support of Gaza over the last 11 months, including some major names that had never spoken out on Palestine before. Uh, in terms of Japan, obviously, I know nothing about Japanese uh, celebrities, uh, but anyone you came out in support um, of, of, of Gaza? Uh, there are a couple of musicians, uh, I suppose, who are fairly famous. Um, there is a band called Asian Kung Fu Generation, which is a Japanese rock band, and the lead singer um, has expressed solidarity. Um, there is a um, kind of like an open letter uh, called Culture Against Apartheid um, that uh, circulated in around December, January um, that I was also a little bit part of. Um, and that actually uh, accumulated a lot of signatures, maybe 6,000 signatures, both from people who have like, you know, um, no, um, no name, um, to people such as Kore Eda Hirokazu, who's a director, um, or... Uh, and other big names as well. Um, so uh, yeah, you can kind of like look at those names. It's in Japanese, unfortunately, but, and see that um, there's a pretty good deal of culture workers um, who definitely support um, the liberation 
the Palestine and into the apartheid and of course ceasefire. Um, although I don't know how many of those people um, do it as publicly. Um, you know, they, they signed the letter, but not necessarily like, um, you know, wear the kafia or the badge. Um, yeah, for me, you know, it's, I, I've been, this is my first kind of narrative feature film that uh, I made, which um, thankfully uh, I'm very honored to say that went to Venice. Um, but I was a little bit, you know, on one hand, like I'm glad to support solidarity in that way with Palestine and I will, always will. But um, at the same time, it was like a little bit disappointing that it became such big news because it should be normal. Like I think everybody should be. And thankfully, like more people, as you were saying, Frank, um, did show eventually, such as um, Sarah Friedland, who received um three awards for her uh, debut fiction film um, and really uh, had a really powerful speech in solidarity with Palestine. But, you know, it really should be more normalized and everybody should be showing their support like all the time. Um, and so, yeah, on one hand, uh, it's great that it was picked up. But on the other hand, it's kind of disappointing that it did become like it. it it's nothing, you know, it's just it's just a kufiya and it, that shouldn't become news really. It should just be normal. Um, so that's how I feel. Hanin, do you want to add anything on this or on anything else? And you'll have the, the last words, I guess. I was just going to say the, about the kind of celebrities and stuff. I think Mayo's not giving himself enough credit and especially all the work that he's put in and and honestly just everybody in the community here like like I told you we are really small community so there's a lot of work that's carried by by a few people honestly and I just I'm so I'm so thankful for them and all the work that they put in you know they're a lot of a lot of them just learned about Palestine recently and you know just the amount of love and empathy that they have is has really made up for all the people that haven't expressed that, especially the people that you thought were friends, that you thought were colleagues, etc. Um, having this community made up for um, all all of that and all the shame that we feel with our with our circle for of our friends that don't speak up. So, yeah, I just want to give credit to them. You know, for me, people thank me, but I say I'm I'm from Gaza. And, I'm from Palestine. This is my duty. This is actually my duty to wake up and do this every single day. But for everyone like you guys all around the world to be doing this and putting the same amount of love and energy every day is just, we're so grateful. We really are grateful for you guys. And I don't think people ha have had enough time to give appreciation to everyone. So I just want to make sure that you guys feel that appreciation from us. We, we truly are thankful, are so grateful. And I hope that all this effort leads us to something and, and doesn't go to waste. I, I truly pray for that. So hopefully soon, sooner than later, we're able to see a free Palestine and, and have this conversation in Palestine. <laughs> Yeah, I can't wait. That's what I keep telling my friends, including Palestinians, you know, mm. see you in uh, Al-Quds uh, yeah. in a free in a free Palestine for yeah. the like the biggest party ever. <laughs> <laughs> um, hey, thanks to you both. Uh, it's really much appreciated. And um, and I mean, yeah, thank you. Thank you, thank you so much. Thank you so much.